Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Shane Ellis examines the livestock markets. Greg Peters updates us on export opportunities for U.S. soybeans. Greg Ibaugh explains the importance of the Census of Agriculture. Catherine Bertini discusses how the United States can help feed a growing population. And Jenny Reese looks at seeding rate options for next year's crop. Shane Ellis from Iowa State is our marketing analyst this week. The Sterling Beef Profit Tracker revealed another rough go for the week ending November 17th, with feedlots showing a negative margin over $93 a head and packers with a loss of more than $83 per head. We talked with Shane Thursday morning and asked what ISU's profitability model showed for beef producers going forward. Well, the, impro the actually improving, uh, I don't know if we could have come off of a harder bottom than what we were a couple months ago, but we're going to slowly see that profitability seep back into the uh, finishing side of things for our producers. From now, uh, probably even some potential profitability as early as uh, January or February, but more than likely March, April, and May are shaping up to be uh, fairly profitable months for our producers. We would hope so. That's usually the best time to be selling cattle and it's uh, looking like we might have a little bit of reprieve like I say from the red ink. What's helping there? Is it uh, lower corn prices? Is it just that tight supply finally coming through? Which is it? Or one, one of those two or none of the above? I think it's uh, definitely a combination of those two. Of course we're not looking at quite eight dollar corn but that uh, uh, corn price is, is still pretty steep. Uh, luckily overall demand has driven down that price of corn and that is helping. Uh, here in Iowa, we're seeing a lot of producers using uh, silage, uh, of course, the uh, co-products. Right. So wherever there's alternative feeds available, that's also going to help the bottom line. On the demand side, yes, we're going to be looking at tighter supplies of beef going out into particularly next year's grilling season. If we're looking at the cattle on feed right now, we're down about 5%. That's definitely an indication of the decline in the number of animals that will be harvested next year. Uh, and that's coming into play a little bit there where we're seeing those prices uh, move upwards. Uh, we were a bit of a doldrums for the last uh, month, not really wondering how demand was going to respond to higher prices coming into the next year. But we've seen that loosened up in, here in the last week or so, and uh, the outlook is, uh, is improving right now. We learned last week that the EPA would not be waiving the renewable fuel standard in the uh, regards to ethanol. Does that surprise you? And do you think it makes a difference here as uh, we look towards maybe next year as well? I don't think it was too much of a surprise. I think a lot of people were hoping that it would be a bit of an opportunity where that uh, uh, could be pushed to the side. But uh, the uh, you know EPA kind of did their own analysis and they determined it would only uh, lower uh, corn prices, maybe a, a, a penny per mm -hmm. bushel. Uh, without getting in, into their analysis side of that, I don't think too many people were surprised that the EPA was dragging their feet. Uh, right now, the amount of ethanol that's being produced is being dictated by the markets. If it's not profitable to produce it, then uh, we're going to see that industry start to put, uh, pull back a little bit. So far, we haven't pushed uh, uh, things back enough on our production to uh, uh, call in to order, you know, why aren't we up to that standard right right now? But in a few 
a year to actually see that standard increasing and exceeding our current capacity for production, I think that's when people are, are really going to start to question. I think that's the, a problem that a lot of folks were hoping to avoid uh, going out there in the future by you know, seeing those uh, renewable fuel standard relaxed a little bit. Uh, we're going to have to see how it kind of plays out. There's a lot of factors coming into the play right now as to whether or not uh, the uh, that standard can still be met. Now, I don't know it's a you know, capacity issue. Yeah, we can build additional plants, uh, but where are we going to see that ethanol used, and is it still uh, viable for a lot of these ethanol plants to produce at their same levels? We talked with you last February, uh, last February in West Point. We talked about turning the ship to try to increase cattle inventory. We were coming off of a drought in Texas. Now we're going to have back-to-back -back droughts with Texas and now the Midwest. There's also a battle for acres, as you mentioned then, between corn and soybeans, wheat, and then trying to turn that land into something for livestock. Uh, how far are we from average or returning to average? On the cattle inventory, uh, we are expecting uh, kind of a leveling off as far as uh, the decline that we've seen the last couple of years. We were hoping that we would see things level off in 2012, but of course the drought uh, kind of pushed that back a little bit further. We saw a lot of liquidation of cows, yeah, some in the Midwest, but particularly more the western uh, states, Colorado, western Kansas, western Nebraska, Wyoming. We will see in the coming years uh, those inventories coming back into those areas and Texas as we see the climate improve. But where we're sitting right now, I don't anticipate additional cows calving until 2015. So that will be the year that we'll start to see the beef calf crop start to increase. Uh, looking at total cattle inventories, we're still bleeding cattle off of the dairy side because profitability is very uh, Non, well, it's just non-existent right. in the dairy industry right now. It's not just elusive. And so they are pulling back on dairy numbers there also. Uh, I think that as we're looking at the total impacts, as we see the weather Im uh, improve and uh, drought conditions moderate for the southern plain states and the western states, that is where we'll see that inventory increase once again. But it will take a few more years before we'll actually see that happen. Uh, anticipating heifer retention uh, being fairly steady at the beginning of this year, maybe up even 1% from last year, but uh, that drought did have an impact. A lot of these guys that maybe were wanting to hold heifers or did hold heifers, they still ended up having to cull pretty heavily just because of the dry conditions. Next week, we'll take a look at the grain markets. The United States grows more soybeans than any other country, at least for now. Nebraska contributes a significant share to that ranking as the fourth largest soybean growing state and exporter in the nation. Already this year, U.S. soybean exports are up 2.2 million tons, thanks in part to large Chinese imports. At the Embassy Suites in Lincoln Monday, we talked with Greg Peters from the Nebraska Soybean Board about finding export opportunities for soybeans. Greg is the District 6 Director for the Nebraska Soybean Board and works with the U.S. Soybean Export Council, where he recently returned from a visit to Mexico. Uh, well, our, our trip to Mexico was, uh, it was a shortened trip. Uh, I was there to uh, be involved in the uh, United Export Strategies for 2014 for uh, the uh, Americas region, which includes the United States, Canada, Mexico, Central, and South America. So these are all producers from that region trying to figure out where to put their money to reach, what, overseas markets? They're for overseas market, the uh, money that we get for uh, export promotion purposes comes from the United Soybean Board, comes from the Foreign Agricultural Service, and come from MAPS uh, program out of the USDA. Uh, part of the, US, the uh, Farm Bill funding program and so with the uh, undecided farm bill, there is question about funds available for market promotion for soybeans uh, in worldwide for that matter, not just Central, not just the Americas, but worldwide. So what are the things that you look at when you're looking at other markets? What plays into it? Well, we look at uh, the population that uh, those markets in, uh, are, are involved in, uh, the return products for those uh, that want to use our soybean oil and our soybean meal. What can they produce that they can make a money on, make a profit on? Uh, basically, we're looking, uh, we talked about food needs for the population of Mexico and Central and South America because they're a very impoverished uh, area down there. And so if we can get uh, some soy product, soy flour or something like that in 
the, uh, their, their basic staple, uh, say like tortillas in Mexico as an example. If we can get a, like a 5% blend of soy flour in the tortilla flour, then that benefits uh, the Mexican uh, public in general as for health benefits. And they have a real uh, obesity problem in Mexico anyway. And so if you can supplement those tortillas with soy flour, that helps the uh, obesity situation, or at least they, the nutritionists seem to tell us that that's gonna help the obesity situation in Mexico. Well, then that opens the door for soy flour processing, which comes from crushing soybeans or from meal that comes from the United States. So the soybean producer in the United States benefits from that type of a, an operation. The other thing that uh, we, another project that we look at is aquaculture. Uh, China is the, uh, was a, a net, is the largest aquaculture producer in the world. This past year, they turned the corner and they are no longer a net exporter of aquaculture products, that they are gonna, a, gonna be a net importer of aquaculture products. Well, where are those products gonna come from? Well, they're gonna come from Southeast Asia because of their relative close position to China. Well, if China takes all the aquaculture products from Southeast Asia, the United States won't have a, a reasonably economical source of, of aquaculture products, say fish, shrimp, uh, lobster coming into this country. The logical producer for those is Central, South America, and Mexico. And so we're promoting uh, those type of feeding demonstrations and those type of producer opportunities in those, those areas to supplement the, aqua, the fish type products coming into the United States, which is uh, the second to oil in imports to the United States is, is uh, fish products. I'm curious as to how you look at China. They're a huge importer of U.S. soybeans. Is that something you look at and say, um, you know, we hope to lean on them for an export market, or is it something where you say, well, we know we have this market, let's try to find more markets like this? Uh, we, tr we try to, it, it's kind of, China's kind of a two-fold animal, because you still have to maintain the uh, market the share that you do have in China. You would like to increase it. Uh, but if you can make them uh, a, a, a net importer of soybeans, then you really don't care where they come from because they're going to take soybeans from wherever they can buy them the cheapest, whether it's Central, South America or whether it's from us. And so the, the important part is that so that we can get rid of our beans or our soy products out of this country to wherever, to China, because of the biggest population growth at this point in time. The next population you've got to look at is in India. That is where the dynamic population growth is, is really occurring. And if you look at the will, worldwide population center for uh, the buying public, it's shifted from Europe in the last 50 years and is now just outside of Pakistan. Okay. And so that in the next 50 years, that is gonna shift over into India as the central, the, uh, the central location for the buying public. And so India will become a, a place where we need to do more soy uh, usage if we can. Soy, India right now is a net exporter of soybean meal. We hope to turn that corner this year to make them a net, either a zero exporter and importer, and from there on out, get them to be an importer of soybeans to uh, suffice their population that they want to feed. As mentioned, Nebraska is the fourth largest soybean producing state. Ranking one, two, and three are Iowa, Illinois, and Minnesota. Every five years, the USDA conducts a census of agriculture to measure America's farmers and ranchers and the land they use. 2012 marks another survey year for the census. We asked Greg Ibaugh, the director of the Nebraska Department of Ag, about the significance of this year's evaluation. This uh, one that's coming up is one that they do every five years that gives them some intermediate data between the 10-year censuses on how many farmers they are and what kind of farms they constitute, uh, how big they are, how many acres they farm, and some of that information. So why is it important that farmers, when they receive this in the mail, why is it important that they fill it out and fill it out accurately? Well, you know, being a farmer myself, mm -hmm. I sometimes look at the farm and think, oh my goodness, you know, why do I want to spend this much time doing that? But in my job as director of ag and working with USDA and Congress and, and other agencies in the federal government, it, it's amazing how many times uh, decision makers are looking at that data and they'll look at it you know, from a county basis clear up to a state and national basis and they decide where funds flow 
based on you know where agriculture exists and what kind of agriculture that is. So to know that we have you know how many cows we have or how many acres of crops we have or how many specialty crop producers we have becomes important to how that money flows into Nebraska. Uh, what types of questions are they asking? I mean, how in depth is it? Well, I think they're going to ask some fairly in depth questions about you know what you farm, how you farm, some of your farming practices and attitudes. But uh, I think it's all um, important to Nebraska and important to Nebraska agriculture to provide as much accurate information as we can so that we're treated fairly when those funding pools become available. You can find the 2007 survey online and see how Nebraska is one of nine states whose ag products together account for half of the country's total value. Once the 2012 census is mailed out next month, you can respond via mail or online. Have you ever thought you'd like to just burn away those weed problems? You might be able to. The November Nebraska Farmer features research and farmer experience about the concept of weed flaming. Weed flaming is a way for organic crop producers to control weeds rather than using herbicides. UNL researchers in northeast Nebraska have designed an eight-row flaming unit that they've used in demonstrations. With the increase in organic acres in the U.S. and the rise of herbicide-resistant weeds, Farmers are showing more interest in weed flaming. You can see how it's done in the November issue of the Nebraska Farmer. Catherine Bertini is a World Food Prize laureate and former executive director of the United Nations World Food Program. She spoke on UNL's East Campus last week as part of the Huerman Lecture Series. Catherine discussed feeding the world's growing population and the U.S. role in that area. Her speech was titled, Where America Must Lead. We started by asking if she saw a shift in U.S. policy on sustaining food production for more people. Well, I think it's a shift to a priority to support poor farmers in developing countries. And those farmers can actually help overall in feeding the world. They can help if poor farmers are more productive. They can help, first of all, with their own uh, hunger issues at home, home, own nutrition, but they can also help build uh, economies and be better trading partners for us. So it's not necessarily ramping up domestic production here in the U.S., making sure that, you know, Brazil and Argentina and all those countries do the same thing. It's more so making sure that the food is there for them. Yes, and over the long term, we want to build more trading partners so that corn grown in Nebraska actually has even more places to be able to be sold, sold worldwide. But in the short term, that's never going to happen in the countries where the biggest population growth is going to occur because they're too poor. Right. So um, uh, it's our role, I think, as a nation to help them to be able to build their own um, agriculture from the smallholder farmer perspective so that the economy can get better, so that the country can improve and ultimately we'll have more trading partners. Does the U.S. share this responsibility with any other countries? Well, I don't know that it's our responsibility as much as it's, it's our... Does it feel like it's our responsibility? Uh, I feel like it's, it's an individual's responsibility to be sure that there's not somebody mm. suffering on the other, right. uh, even on the other side of the world, let alone in our neighborhood. But um, worldwide, uh, it's going to be our job, I think, not just the U.S., the Europeans, the Japanese, everybody else who has some uh, extra resources to be able to contribute, to be able to help uh, poor populations become less poor, especially as they grow. And when we don't do that, we have other problems, too. There's, there's a direct correlation between high food prices, for instance, that have spiked right. in 2008 and right. more recently with unrest. And uh, uh, people are unhappy, especially in big cities, and, and they protest. A lot of those are in poor countries, and a lot of those become very problematic from an international security perspective. The next scheduled speaker in the Huberman Lecture Series is Temple Grandin from Colorado State. Temple will speak on improving animal welfare and communication with the public on January 15th. You may have seen our interview with Al Dutcher last week detailing how far behind many parts of Nebraska are in moisture. As producers look at planning for next year's crop, they face an unusual circumstance in following one of the most severe droughts in history. Several UNL researchers recently looked at how seeding rates in dryland corn would be affected by a lack of moisture versus seeding population in different areas of the state. We spoke with Jenny Reese at UNL Extension's fall conference about that study and how the hybrid maize model tracked this season's water deficit. Throughout the season, we were simulating what was the potential for that corn crop based on perfect conditions. And it was assuming that 100% of um, soil moisture going into the season. 
But we know in some parts of the state, even in my area of the state in South Central Nebraska, we didn't have full 100% field capacity going into the growing season. And so um, a recent CropWatch article was simulating, well, what would happen if, if you simulated yields based on other um, Basically saying, what if I don't have 100% soil moisture coming in? That's right. So it was looking at, let's say, 75% of field capacity, 100% of field capacity. And, and what Haishun Yang did is he was looking at it, yield trends, population um, trends for both North Platte and Mead. And, and what it showed, essentially, is that at North Platte, the trend wasn't very steep. So it didn't really increase yield. It didn't benefit the producer to have a higher population if um, the moisture wasn't there. I mean, a lot of that makes sense. Sure. At Mead, it made a bigger impact. If the, if the moisture was there, the population should be increased for a better yield. So for this year, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to add that in at the beginning to show maybe what could happen if you start out with 50% soil moisture, 75 or 100? Is that what you're planning for this year then? So what we'd like to do this year is just the reason why we sh shared this information is just to get farmers thinking right now, you know, as you think about inputs, seed inputs, fertilizer inputs, think about, well, if I don't start out with the full soil profile, which is probably very likely with the drought that we've had, what should I be considering for a seed population? Now, granted, we didn't provide recommendations for populations. We have research that's going to be coming out, um, latest research from both on-farm research and farmers' fields as well as the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And that'll be coming this winter yet to help farmers better be able to make those decisions. I know one thing that gave you an advantage last year, you installed a watermark sensor, so you knew kind of going into the year where you were. Is that something that a lot of farmers could gain from? That's right. So one thing I had done last year was installed watermark sensors in some dry land fields just to see, okay, where are we at with our soil moisture profile? And it was interesting going into the 2012 season, our fourth foot profile in south central Nebraska in dryland fields, in no-till, mind you, was already 35% depleted. The third foot was 25% depleted. We knew that going into the 2012 growing season, so that could help farmers understand, okay, I need to either lower my populations, maybe I consider sorghum. And so this is something if we have farmers who have watermark sensors or other soil moisture sensing equipment, I'd recommend that they go ahead, get them out, installed in their fields after harvest, um, whether it's dry land fields, fields where they had a low capacity well, weren't able to keep up, or fields where, let's say, maybe they're in an allocation situation. They may even consider their fully irrigated fields just to see where they're really at. But it would be really interesting for them to do it at least down to three feet, and I would recommend down to four feet, just to really understand what's going on in that profile prior to planting in 2013. You can find more information on seeding rates in an archived article on the CropWatch website. Dry conditions continued across Nebraska this week. In the past 60 days, the western two-thirds of the state received less than one inch of precipitation. Now here to forecast any chances of rain or snow over the next several days, here is UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Unfortunately, because of the university holiday shutdown, we're unable to give you the most current forecast because we're taping in advance of the holiday weekend. I do want to bring your attention to the fact that the numerical models are indicating a fairly substantial slice of cold air moving down to the Central Plains, particularly as we move into the early part of next week. And based on right now what the models are projecting, as that cold air shifts southward, it looks like it's going to be forced up against the Rocky Mountains and possibly generate what we call an orographic lift situation. That is, cold air pushes up against the mountain, causes lifts, and then we see some snow on the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And in fact, the models are extending some of that snowfall into the southern half of the Panhandle and portions of western Nebraska. It looks like the southern Panhandle will receive the best chances right now in terms of moderate types of snowfall, anywhere from two to four inches, possibly heavier depending on how long lived the event is. But as you slide east of there, the precipitation totals right now are projected to drop off rather dramatically such that we may only see a scattering of light snow or flurries as we get into west central, into central Nebraska and farther east. It doesn't look like much in the way of any significant snow. And then we'll see several impulses of energy coming down on that northwest flow that may give us continuous chances of uh, scattered light snowfall, but again, no significant uh, accumulations. 
pay attention to the weather models because at this time of the year things can dramatically change and a model that is indicating just a light event can dramatically shift to a potent winter storm. So be, be aware that there is some significant weather that may invade earlier in the week and we need to be aware of that. But for now, let's take a look at where the current drought situation in Nebraska stands and what we can expect as we go for the next three months according to the Climate Prediction Center. I'll draw your attention to the core area of the drought once again is over the center part of the country with Nebraska primarily in the exceptional drought classification scheme, which is essentially the highest drought classification scheme and extends all the way to our south. We've seen some pretty significant recovery in the eastern Corn Belt and the expectations with normal precipitation going forward that we will see pretty close to full soil moisture recharge by the time we get to spring, at least from Illinois eastward. And there's a very decent potential we'll see some of that same kind of conditions developing across the eastern half of Iowa. A little bit more interesting as you get west of here because we've been persistently dry now for the last couple of months here in the center part of the state and we've already accumulated a couple inches of deficits across a good portion of the state, particularly north and west of the I-80 corridor from Lincoln to Omaha. And again, we're going to be running out of time to get those soil moisture profiles cha uh, charged back up in time for spring. So it's going to have to be a very wet winter and a very wet spring to make up some of these differences. And we can see by the projections that they are indicating the persistence of the drought to continue with some moderation in the drought to our east. In terms of the 30-day uh, forecast, we're starting to see a colder trend in the models moving up close to Nebraska. In terms of precipitation, the only area showing above normal precipitation is the eastern Corn Belt. The 90-day forecast again keeps that colder trend in play and in terms of precipitation, once again, moisture to our east, but no significant dry pattern established in the, firmly in the forecast for the Central Plains. Thanks, Al. Our interviews with Shane Ellis, Greg Peters, Greg Eibach, Catherine Bertini, and Jenny Reese are archived on the Market Journal website and on the Market Journal mobile app. Next week, we close out November and look to the final month of the year. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Bio Diesel helps a diesel powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The soybean checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up.